Hello, I wanted to spend a few minutes demonstrating what I think is a superior method for teaching next-gen shader scripting to artists. Actually, I think it would be valuable to programmers as well as artists. Um, what I've got here is just a Unity scene uh, with the sphere right now with uh, absolutely no shader detail on it. And we're going to create a brand new one. Over here I've um, created a, a folder called Ed's Shaders. In there is the shader for the floor and the shader for the ball. Now let's just go look at a typical shader. Bunch of code. And this is exactly how it's done. Uh, all of this up at the top is just comments. Um, here's where the program actually begins. All of this above the program, the definition is what the shader is looking for from the user. It's going to be asking for these things um, in the GUI. And down here, um, pre lighting, forward lighting definition, uh, deferred lighting definition. And down here is the main node diffuse color, emissive color, specular transparency, gloss, and bump mapping, normal mapping, uh, all laid out there. And here is the mathematics for how uh, the things up here at the top that we were going to ask the user for are applied to this node. Um, now, teaching this to an artist is not going to be easy. Um, look at that. It's actually fairly simple mathematics. But it's scaring me, and uh, I understand it. You leave, look, we've got five consecutive uh, parentheses here. You leave a single one of those out, and it doesn't work. Not only will it not work, it won't compile, and you'll spend hours trying to figure out why it isn't working, but you'll also uh, be dealing with an artist who wants to just get to why doesn't it look proper in the lighting situation that I want. So what happens is, uh, programmers are most qualified to write these shaders and least qualified to decide if they look good. Uh, whereas artists are the ones uh, most qualified to decide if it looks good, least qualified to produce them, which is why technical art is such a valuable skill. Still, the way to teach it is to use a visual um, object-oriented method. There's a lot of different tools. Uh, Mental Mill is one of them. Um, from Mental Ray runs uh, on almost all the packages. This one is one for Unity, uh, written actually just by a user that you can get from the asset store. Um, and it's very typical of how they work. Uh, so let's go ahead and create our own um, right here. In Ed's shader, I'm going to create an empty shader. We'll just call it New Shader. And then I'm going to go in here and find it. And it's shaders, new shader. And there it is, completely empty. What this is going to do is connect a texture to the diffuse channel. Uh, this is one of those elements up at the top of the program that defines what it's looking for. So we're just going to call this uh, diffuse map. And it's going to be asking the user for the uh, diffuse map. If I save that, it is now compiled. And I can go find it right here. New shader. And there it is. Diffuse lighting function with no texture applied to it. It's asking me for a diffuse map. Uh, so let's give it one. Uh, how about that one? And I'm going to increase the tiling on it. So it's a little easier to see. And there we go. Now let's have a look at the script. See, it's still, it's still the unapproachable syntax of code. But it's now a little bit e easier to understand. Here's where the program begins, right there. This is the stuff the program's looking for. It's very simple right now. Uh, a diffuse map, color, specular color, uh, alpha cutoff, which we aren't going to use, 
and the same stuff I showed you before, including the base node. Diffuse color, emissive color, specular, alpha, gloss. And that is something we can teach. A diffuse shader, what it looks like, and, but they've understood how it connects together by looking at it uh, interactively. Now, an artist is going to look at this and say, well, that's cool, but the specular highlight there is a little too flat. It uh, moves over the entire surface evenly. Uh, looks like it's a little too polished. Uh, so what we want to do is add a specular map, which is just another texture uh, tied to the specular channel. And we're going to name that something that the uh, user will understand. Specular map. I'm going to save it. Come back in here. And now we'll see it appear over here under the shader, uh, specular map. And I'm going to use the same texture, actually, just to make it easy. Uh, so now what we have is, you'll notice the green areas uh, don't have as pronounced a specular highlight as the white areas do. It's because it's using uh, the uh, luminance value of this texture to define where uh, the specular works and it looks more realistic and uneven like this green material is made of something different than the white material. Nice. Uh, the artist is now going to probably say eh, we're missing bump. This is next generation. We need normal maps. Uh, so we're going to create a map. We'll call it the user expects normal map, but unlike the old days, it's not just a grayscale map anymore. Um, it's a full color map, so we're going to unpack those normals before we attach them to the uh, bump map channel. And Ed is having a little difficulty getting it to connect. And there we go. Uh, save it. When we come back in here, uh, this is now going to be asking me soon for a normal map. And I have prepared one. Needs to have the same tiling as the others. And there we go. Normal mapped, diffused, specular mapped shader. Uh, starting to come together. You can see the bumps happening. It's pretty interesting. Uh, an engineer may well say, well, we're done. It looks great. Let's keep going. But an artist is going to think, you know, this isn't done. Sometimes the shader is going to be in total darkness, and I don't like the fact that it's uh, when you're lit from the other side, you can't see it at all. We want a little of the Pixar effect. We want some of the... Um, uh, rim lighting, back lighting for those who come from a photography background to appear. Um, so why don't we create backlighting somehow for this shader? Uh, how do we do that? Well, that's actually called a Fresnel effect. We have a node for it. Let me demonstrate to you what it does. Fresnel effect takes the light the light, the surface that's pointing towards you is brightest. The surface that's pointing away from you is dark. And so the outline uh, of the surface is always dark. If you look at it, you probably guess that that's how tune shaders are done. And you'd be right. Uh, but we want the exact opposite. We want it to be dark in the middle and light on the edges. Uh, so what we need to do is invert the Fresnel effect. How do we do that? Well, all we really do... So we take the number, this is a number node, the number is 1, and we are going to simply subtract the Fresnel effect from it. 1 minus Fresnel effect equals inverted Fresnel effect. And there we go. Black in the middle, light on the edges. That's what we were looking for, backlighting. 
Uh, we don't want it to be in the diffuse channel though. I'm just doing that to demonstrate what it looks like. So we're going to put it in the emissive channel and reconnect the diffuse map. And now when we turn it back on, we'll see uh, the texture map with backlighting. Uh, it's a little bit intense, isn't it? Um, what we want to do, and the artist will understand this right away, whereas an engineer might not, is increase the contrast of this uh, light, this white light, uh, so that it's darker all the way to the edge before it gets light. And all we really have to do to make that work is to use um, a power function. And so I'm going to get a parameter of number. It's just going to be asking the user for a number. And we'll call this contrast and a power node. And what we do is we say the Fresnel effect that we created before, the inverted Fresnel effect, raised to the power of whatever the user wants, fed into the emissive channel. Let me put it all up there so you can see it. Will give us a contrast control. And look what happens. We now have a Fresnel contrast variable right there that lets us adjust how much of that effect uh, shows up as uh, backlighting. The engineer, again, would probably look at that and say, great, we're done. That's what they wanted, rim lighting. Uh, let's move on. Well, the artist is going to look at that and say, it's a little cartoonish, and the reason is uh, it's just adding white light to the texture. It's not blending them together, it's just adding the white light. Um, it's not very realistic, light doesn't really do that. We need them to blend together the color of the uh, tiles with the white light. And uh, that's easy. Here's the diffuse map, here is the color, the tile. I'm just going to uh, connect it to two places. I'm going to connect it to the diffuse map where we had it, but I'm also going to multiply it by all of this stuff. So we disconnect that. We multiply the diffuse map by the inverted powered Fresnel effect. Send it back into the emissive channel. I can just click the right button. Hit save, and bingo, we now have rim lighting with a normal mapped, specular mapped surface that casts shadows in an environment. Now that texture right there is as complex as uh, you might have seen on the Master Chief in Halo 3. He probably paid a programmer a lot of money to write it, and it probably took him a week and a half, and I did it in 10 minutes. Uh, it's also not trivial. What we just did, there's a bunch of math in here. It's not that nasty. You can imagine it gets a lot worse. There's our new shader right there. Uh, all this stuff up here is comments. Here's where the program begins. Here's the stuff we were looking for that we defined. Normal map, specular map, diffuse map, all of the rest of it. Here's the uh, pre-lighting, forward lighting, deferred lighting, variable declarations. Here's the main uh, node, diffuse, emissive, specular, alpha, gloss. And mathematically, how we're combining uh, the elements up here with the node down here and these variables that are defined just for this procedure. Uh, easy? No. But easier to understand? Absolutely. Because we have laid it out in a way that an artist can uh, deal with it. And what we actually do here is we end up with the result sooner 
that's closer to what is aesthetically pleasing, what an artist is qualified to decide, uh, than what an engineer probably would have come up with. Also, the artist can look at what an engineer has spent three days writing code for and say, it just doesn't look right, but I can't tell him how to fix it by looking at that code. Um, that's why I'm convinced this is the future, object-oriented design. Uh, it's the best way to teach even the coding part uh, because of the way the mind works.